600 of altcoins already. Yes. And uh, about 100 of altcoins went to zero already. So how do you... Well, they didn't go to zero, they went to 0 0.000015. <laughs> Someone still has them. Yeah, but how, how, uh, how do you know or how do you believe that uh, the Bitcoin is not the case of another altcoin? How do you, what, what is the difference between, for example, Bitcoin and, I don't know, Litecoin or uh, another, another uh, cryptocurrency? Uh, uh, why, we, do, why do you prefer Bitcoin? We did it first. We did it best. We've got the absolute best development team in the industry, the most intelligent, amazing scientists, engineers, software engineers, and development teams that are building amazing stuff every day. And I can barely keep up, keep up. You know, just when I think it's like, okay, I'm done reading for the day, and somebody drops segregated witness on me or some new innovation, and I'm amazed again. So I mean here's the other important thing which people don't realize is that Bitcoin today is not what Bitcoin was in 2009. It's the same name, it's the same 21 million coin cap, it's more or less the same transaction structure, but a lot of other things have changed quite dramatically. One of the stories of scaling is that sometimes the only thing that scales is the brand. I'm 44 years old, not a single cell in my body is one that I was born with. They've all been replaced by now. They're all gone. All that remains is the pattern, right? And so, when I was in college, they said Ethernet can't scale to one megabit, and Ethernet can't scale beyond five megabit, and Ethernet can't scale beyond ten megabit. Ethernet is a networking system, if you're not aware. And I installed Ethernet that was a coaxial cable as thick as my thumb, and it could only go 100 meters, and it could only do five meg. And today. All of the local area networks run on Ethernet that can now do 10 gig over fiber. But how much of that is really Ethernet, and how much of that is just the word Ethernet attached to what we made it into? Because it's a different distribution medium, a different architecture. The only things that are really the same are maybe the frame size and the brand. So one of the issues that you have to reconcile yourself with is that Bitcoin 15 years ago may only 15 years from now may only share with today's Bitcoin three or four fundamental properties, a 21 million coin cap. That's not going away. If that goes away, it's not Bitcoin. But that, the brand name and some basic architecture characteristics, everything else may change. Everything else may be completely revised, and we'll just still call it. Bitcoin. So, um, I don't believe that we need to worry too much, but altcoins to me are a very important part of the ecosystem. And in fact, the more we have and the more they experiment, the better it is. Something really important happened this year. People fled Bitcoin into Ethereum, and that was awesome. That was awesome. Because all of the previous times when they fled Bitcoin, they left the cryptocurrency economy. And this time, they sw simply switched lanes. <laughs> they didn't abandon cryptocurrencies. They left Bitcoin and went into Ethereum to see what the other side is doing. Look at what's going on over there. They're not fighting yet. <laughs> <laughs> They're still scaling for now. And look, it's all cozy and nice, and they've got contracts and smart stuff. They also have humans, and human nature always prevails. And so, pretty soon, you're going to see some interesting things like the ones we have in Bitcoin happen. Bitcoin was fine; it was scaling fine in 2012. Nobody was arguing then. <laughs> so the bottom line is that um, we're now keeping people in the cryptocurrency space. And as people went to Ethereum and the price went up, new people came in from the outside who, in order to buy Ethereum, because they didn't believe that Bitcoin was a good medium of exchange, first bought Bitcoin to use it as a medium of exchange to buy Ethereum. <laughs> and so we'll see how it goes, but I'm very optimistic. Hey. Um, you said the Ethereum network said to us, uh, what do you think about the role 
in the future of the outcomes? You know, I when I started working in Bitcoin, I believed that we would see maybe one, two, three, four, five different currencies that could succeed in different ways, and that they would have to fight each other for dominance. Um, and I was wrong, because I was looking at Bitcoin from the perspective of experience with national currencies, and that's how national currencies behave. Uh, they're in a zero-sum game. Once I saw that more altcoins were being created and they acted as a laboratory, I realized the connections between money and language, and why, just like there are hundreds of thousands of human languages, there will be hundreds of thousands of alternative currencies and chains, and then perhaps millions. And they will continue to be created at a rate of thousands per year, and then tens of thousands per year. And maybe most of them will not have very significant economic value. Maybe some of them will only have um, the value of reputation, or loyalty, or popularity, or historical significance. Or they'll explore a single narrow feature or capability. There will be thousands, and they will all have value to someone. Because even five-year-olds create currencies. If you watch a kindergarten. They create currencies out of rubber bands and colored blocks and crayons. They trade tokens of value with each other to express popularity and friendship. So human beings create currencies. It's a natural process. It's an evolutionary imperative. So we will create thousands of them, and they may not have the same interest or value, but they will be powerful. You know, I say sometimes people think it's funny, but imagine what happens when you have Justin Bieber coin. Now, for one thing, that's a horrifying idea, Justin Bieber coin. But at the same time, if that was created today, it would very quickly have more value than at least 15 national currencies, <laughs> easily, right? And so, is that money? It is to a Justin Bieber fan. It's meaningful. It's valuable. It's exchangeable. It creates loyalty and social connection. We are redefining how we see money, from a field of narrow perspective and monopolies, to an explosion of diversity that will flood our brains with thousands of currencies. And hopefully one day it will be so easy to use any of them that it will become irrelevant which currency you use, and currency will simply disappear into the background. Thank you, Andreas, for the inspiring talk. Um, what do you have to say about other coins uh, coming up? You think we'll have a sea of coins, each with its function? Uh, Ether is really popular now. Mm -hmm. Smart contracts. Will other coins come up? How do you see it happening? Yes, they will. And this is something fundamental to understand about the new world of digital currencies or cryptocurrencies, of network-centric currencies is that we try to apply to them the ideas of the past. And we have all lived our entire lives in a system that delineates currencies by nationality, and allows them to be centralized, and also to compete in a zero-sum game. One currency wins only if another currency loses. What better example for that can you see than the fact that right now 24 central banks have set their interest rates to zero or negative in order to create a race of devaluation of their currency so they can er erase their debt. They're racing against each other to the bottom. And that is exactly the result you have in a closed system with strict borders. But that's not what happens with Bitcoin. The important thing to realize is that money is not its physical form. Money is a form of language. Money is the language that we use to express value to each other. And money emerges in societies regardless of its physical form. It even emerges in primate societies. You can teach monkeys how to use money. And they will adopt it and teach it to their offspring. 
and they will also invent new financial things like prostitution and robbery. <laughs> you beat the other monkey, you take its pebbles, and you get bananas. Money emerges among kindergarten children, even if they don't understand money. They trade tokens of money, colored blocks, rubber bands, Pokemon cards. It doesn't matter. Why? Because money is a lubricant for social interaction. If you have a language with which you express value, you can also express appreciation and belonging and lubricate the social connections. And if you look at money as a language, then we need to rethink this idea that this is a competition for who becomes the one global winner. English is a very popular language. Did you all stop learning your local language because of that, or did you learn two, and three, and four? In the world, we have thousands of languages, and though we may see some power in some of the major languages, people can adapt in a way that they can use multiple languages. And the language connects them to their culture. And so, when money becomes a language, as Bitcoin has, the idea that it will be replaced, or that we're looking to see which one is going to be the winner, is as ridiculous as asking if English or Spanish will become the one global language, or Mandarin. The bottom line is that we will have thousands of coins, and then we will have tens of thousands of coins, and most of them will have no economic value, but they will have cultural significance. They will have value of loyalty. They will be representing fans or creative appreciation. And some of them will be very large and have economic value. If you have a system like that, what emerges and that what we see in statistics and mathematics again and again is a power law or Pareto distribution. Just like you have 20 languages that are the world's most popular, but then you have a long tail of thousands of languages behind them. 20 artists who are some of the world's most popular and hundreds of thousands of artists behind them. And currencies will evolve in that way. We may have 20 currencies that have major economic value and fit in specific niches. Smart contracts, micropayments, cross-border transactions, solid reserve, etc. And then we will have tens of thousands in what is called the long tail. So, one of the things we have to do is get rid of old thinking when it comes to looking at this medium. We don't yet understand exactly how it's going to be evolved. And there's a very simple reason for that. We've never done this before. This is the first time in history that we've seen this emergent phenomenon happen. And you are sitting on the front rows of history. So, yes, Ether, made safe, bring it on. <laughs>